If you're interested in the photography that I do and seeing more of it, um, my vanity URL, sillarena.com. Uh, my blog, speedlighting.com, and that is spelled Canon's way, S-P-E-E-D-L-I-T-I-N-G. And then on Twitter, and I have to say, I love Twitter. 140 characters, that's like my whole attention span these days. I'm in, I'm out, and there's like a whole blog post in one tweet. So that's sill underscore arena. And I do use Twitter seriously as a way to send out resources and announcements. So, um, all right, and now here's just a screen grab from my blog, a post I did a couple of weeks ago about a shoot. Uh, I was in Dubai in November teaching a Gulf Photo Plus, and I had the opportunity to shoot this falconer at sunset. So if you've not visited speed lighting, that's a place where I condense a lot of my thoughts and my techniques. There, as David mentioned, is the cover of Speedlighter's handbook, um, which has done very well, and I'm very grateful for that. I also want to take the opportunity, as long as I have the microphone and the clicker, to give you a quick uh, peek at what will be coming out next summer. I'm doing another book with Peach Pit Press called Light and Lighting. And this is an opportunity for me to talk in broader strokes about the whole realm of light. And it's not specific to any type of gear. And it is oriented towards somebody who is literally just stepping forward for the first time, really thinking consciously about light and about how to light. A lot of us go through this phase where we've got a point and shoot or everything's an automatic, and we're trying desperately to get out of that automatic mode. And so this hopefully will be a book. It's half the size literally um, of Speedlighter's Handbook. So if that four pound book intimidated you, I think you'll find this one to be very, very user friendly. Um, and again, that's next summer. I literally just turned in chapter one last week. So there we go. And lastly, um, workshops. I'm online at Kelby Training. And then in the summertime, this summer I have week-long workshops. I have two week-long workshops in Maine, one specific to Canon speed lighting. And also, um, Santa Fe has brought me on this summer. That's a large light workshop. I teach in Dubai, as I mentioned, at Gulf Photo Plus. And then from time to time, my hometown of Paso Robles, California, is the hub of California's Central Coast wine industry. I get paid five cents by the Chamber of Commerce every time I say the word Paso Robles, Paso Robles, Paso Robles. <laughs> so um, it's a little town halfway between LA and San Francisco. So we do workshops there from time to time. Now, I think it's really important every time you hear somebody talk that you understand kind of where's their realm of philosophies, where are they coming from as a photographer. So I want to take you through six of my image making philosophies. Number one, and this is really important, it sounds simple, but I think it's really important. There's two types of photographers, there's documentarians and there's pictorialists. I am definitely in the pictorial camp, and I want you to understand that because it influences my workflow tremendously. Documentarian is basically interested in making a photograph of the world as it appears in front of his or her lens. I very seldom am interested in the world as it appears in front of my lens unless I'm just taking a snapshot because I see a cool patch of light. But I am really interested in shaping light and using that light to shape the personas of the people who happen to step in front of my lens. Now, I shoot Canon gear, gentleman shoots Olympus, another gentleman shoots Nikon. The reality is, it's gear. And ultimately, what we all need to focus on are the images. So don't get hung up on saying, oh, I've got to have this and this and this and this and this. And I'll say that right here at B&H Photo. The most important thing is, you master the gear you have. I had an email from Brazil this morning, a gentleman said, hey, I've got this lens and this lens and this lens and this lens, and all I'm really able to do is to make landscapes and portraits. I'm thinking about buying this lens and this lens and a couple of speed lights and blah, 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 blah. And I emailed him back and I said, look, what you really need to do is just think about light and learn how to light with the gear you already have. You don't need more gear necessarily. There's always room for more gear, perhaps, but master the gear you have. And this is the reason I say it. Nobody's going to say, oh, gosh, yeah, absolutely. Shot that with a 7200 F2.8L Mark II. They're going to remember you by the images that you create, not by the gear. Now, in this digital world, I choose to be a photographer and not a retoucher. I came out of years and years and years, like decades and decades, of shooting film. And early on, when I became a digital shooter, I went so far into the world of Photoshop that I really said, oh, I don't need to worry about that in front of the camera because I'll just fix it in Photoshop. And after saying that for years, in some ways, I felt like I lost my soul in the world of image making. And so I've come back and I say, I choose to be a photographer. 
not a retoucher. Sure, there are some things that we have to do in Photoshop or in Lightroom, all right? But if I can do it in front of my lens before I push the shutter button, if I can change my camera angle, if I can change the gel on a light, if I can change the modifier to create the light that I'm really looking for, then that's what I mean by saying I'm a photographer and I'm not a retoucher. I think Photoshop and Lightroom are an important part of my workflow, but definitely I choose to be a photographer. Now if you learn to see light, and I really, really mean truly learn to see light, all right? Become obsessed with light. Look at light around you all the time. Amy and I were having lunch a couple of hours ago, and she you know, says, you got that kind of glaze thing working. And I said, yeah, I'm looking at that light in that woman's face, and I'm just kind of looking around the restaurant. All right? And I'm looking at the light on your faces. I'm saying, oh, here's rim light. Here's fill light. Become obsessed with light, looking at light every minute of the day. Here in Manhattan, the light is incredible. Not necessarily in a day like today with overclass sky, <coughs> but some days it's amazing how the sun just bounces off of bunches and bunches of buildings and crashes down into an intersection with the most amazing light, way better than anything Hollywood could ever create. So if you learn to see those moments, I guarantee you, your photography is going to improve automatically. Because being a better photographer, in my view, begins with learning to see light. Now then, moving on, once you really understand or begin to understand the concepts of light, and we're going to talk about a bunch of them today, once you begin to understand how to see light, then you can learn how to craft light. And then as a pictorialist, in my view, I can use my ability to craft light to literally create the persona of the person in the frame. Now I save the best for last in my opinion. If there was anything I wanted you to go home today with, it's this thought. To create interesting shadows, excuse me, to create interesting light, you have to create interesting shadows. To create interesting light, you have to create interesting shadows. So always look at the light but think about the shadows. We all say, oh, it's all about lighting. I'll suggest you know it's really about shadowing. If you can create the shadows that you want, if you know how to create those shadows, the lighting happens automatically. OK. So for the next couple of minutes, I'm, I'm going to stop blabbing. And I just, I'm going to slide you through a couple, maybe, I don't know, maybe 25 or 30 images from my portfolio. And because we're here to talk about how to create great light with Canon speed lights, every one of the images you're about to see was lit with Canon speed lights. OK. So that's the kind of work that I do with Canon speed lights. And again, for me, it's very much about the shadows. And I hope there's a few aha moments in the audience where you're going, oh, now I get why he's talking about shadows. Shadows, to me, are really the key to, create, to creating interesting light. Now, one of the things that's also really important to me is to kind of, I'm a self-appointed evangelist for a feature on our Canon gear that enables us to control every function of our speed light from the LCD of our camera. Now, I don't know about you, but about the time I hit 40, my arms 
kind of got not long enough to see the back of my speed light. Those little icons that I had a hard time understanding anyway became even harder and harder to read. Uh -huh. <laughs> Amen, right, I got it. <laughs> Amen. So I want to show you, if you've got the right gear, I want to show you, and I'm going to do a live demo in just a couple of moments, I want to show you how to control every function of your speed light in the language of your choice. Our cameras come programmed in English and Japanese, Spanish, French, German, Italian, a whole bunch of Asian languages beyond Japanese. So whatever language you're most comfortable working in, you can read the command system for every function, every little button and dial move you can make in a Canon Speedlight. You can read on the LCD of your camera. And then I'm going to, a little bit later, I'm going to talk to you about how I'm going to control the speed light inside that soft box over there from the back of my camera here. All right? It's amazing technology. It's been around for five years, almost five years, and yet very few of us know about it. It took me a couple of years to trip into it, and I began to explore. I was like, holy cow, this is really amazing. So to make this work, you've got to basically have a camera body that was introduced after the midpoint of 2007. So hopefully your camera is over there on the left-hand side of the screen somewhere. I happen to shoot a Canon 5D Mark II. And then you have to have a current generation speed light. So if there's a disconnect, if you have, for instance, the original 5D and a 580 EX2, you're not going to have this technology in the camera. If you've got the 5D Mark II, but you have the original 430EX speed light, you're not going to have the technology. I truly did not see the value of the 580EX2 for at least a year after I had my first one. I had the right camera, I had the right speed light, but I never put them together and tripped into this menu section. All right? Now, I'm going to ask David to come on up, and he's actually going to hook up my camera so I can take you through a little bit of it. The thing to know is that where you find that menu depends upon the camera model that you're shooting. All right? So 5D Mark II, it's over on the yellow wrench three dot menu. The 7D, it's on the red camera one dot menu. And then on the 50D and likely on the 60D, it's on the yellow wrench three dot. So you just have to look for a menu selection that says either external speed light control or flash control. So here's the LCD of my 5D Mark II. Basically what we've done is connected my camera through an HDMI cable. So the screens around the room, the screen here, is showing you what would otherwise be right on the back of your camera. So I'm going to jump over to, in the 5D Mark II, it's the yellow wrench three dot menu. And I'm going to jump right into flash function settings. So this literally mimics every button and dial you have on your speed light. And as I mentioned before, you have to have a current model speed light. So if there's a reason to upgrade to a 580EX2 or a 430EX2, I guarantee you it's this functionality. Because if you have the right camera body but you don't have the right speed light, once you make that right combination and the ability to do this, so I can change my flash mode. ETTL manual or stroboscopic, also known as multi. I can change my sync modes. We're going to talk about much of this functionality today. So you're like, what the heck is first curtain or second curtain? Don't worry about that. But just to show you, so now the speed light that I'm controlling, by the way, is over in the softbox across the room. And I have a 33 foot ETTL cord that's connecting the camera to the speed light. And that's another important part of the system. Either the controlling speed light has to be right in the camera's hot shoe or you have to have an ETTL cord connecting the two. You cannot use a regular PC sync cord and radio triggers like the old school pocket wizards or those little cactus triggers and those kind of things won't get the job done either. So we're going to go on a quick, <coughs> quick tour of some of the other functionalities. Again, flash exposure compensation. We'll talk about this when we talk about the difference between ETTL and manual mode. But the great thing is here we can dial flash exposure compensation up and down. Zoom. I use Zoom as a creative tool in my image making. So I can literally, now you guys, if we're really quiet, you might be able to hear that speed light change its flash head. Did you hear it? 
Okay. And we're not going to go too deep into wireless, but this is where this menu system becomes truly a godsend in terms of decrypting all of these minuscule icons on the Speedlight's LCD. And here we have them in English in terms of do we enable or disable the master channel, the almighty flash firing ratios in wireless. So if you've really struggled with your wireless control of speed lights because you find those icons really hard to understand in the back of this speed light, then hopefully you can connect up the right kind of speed light. And I'm basically just using the menu button on the back of my camera and the set button in the select wheel to jump around through these various options, okay? It's amazing technology and so many Canon shooters don't know that it exists. Um, it's a great user interface. All right, so we're going to cut back to the other side and continue. All right, you ready for the crash course? It's like we've been going click, 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 click up the roller coaster. Now the cars are right at the top and we're going to go right down. I want to walk you through as quickly as I can what I call my seven point checklist for speed lighting. Okay? So you're going to see that the seven features or seven points in the checklist on the left hand side and I'm just going to talk about the concept behind each one. I like to layer information out rather than just dump it on you real deep from the beginning. So you're going to see these images again and you're going to see that we revisit these concepts. But in my workflow the first thing I start out with is my exposure for the ambient light. The ambient light is the light that I generally cannot control. It's the sun. It's the lights in the room. It's the lights coming from who knows where. And so if I think about the ambient light before I turn on my flash, I will then be able to build my flash on top of informed decisions. So for instance, the only difference between these two images is not that one has flash and the other doesn't because they both have the exact same amount of flash. The difference between the two is that on the left, I shot at a 30th of a second. On the right, I shot at 125th of a second. So there's two stops of difference in the ambient light. Where I live in California, it's a sun-drenched environment most of the year. So I'm typically making a move where I'm underexposing the ambient. If you live in a climate where it's cloudy most of the time, you can actually go in the opposite direction. You can use longer shutter speeds to lift the quality of the ambient. You can literally turn a cloudy looking gloomy day into a bright sun filled lit day. Now you're not going to get necessarily streaks of light pouring in through the windows on a cloudy day, but you can certainly make it look like there's a ton of sunlight outside a window. <coughs> then I think about what's the purpose of my speed light or each of my speed lights if I'm using multiple lights. Key light. If my speed light's a key light then I'm going to think this is the main source of light on my subject. Sometimes I use the sun as the key light. A lot of times I use a speed light as the key light. Then a fill light. If I have the sun behind my subject, as you'll see in a moment, the camera side of the subject will fall into deep shadow. Our ETTL system is brilliant when it comes to calculating what is the right amount of flash for fill flash purposes. Rim light. I'm a huge advocate of throwing light behind your subject and firing it towards the camera. Or if you want a simple two light solution, point two light sources at each other, put your subject in between those two, and then explore that lighting as you move your camera in a semicircle around your subject. So that that light coming from behind your subject serves as a rim light, a little bit of separation light. And then finally, background light. That can be the light that we throw on to a particular area. I do a lot of environmental portraits. So I want to use the ambient light. And when there's not enough ambient light, I'll use a flash to light elements in the background. But typically, in my style of lighting, I don't want the lighting in the background to be as dominant as the light on my subject. I want you, the viewer, to concentrate on my subject. So any speed light can fall into any of those four categories, you really need to think about what do I want this flash to do? And most of us never really think about that. Now position. Position, if you think about it in terms of a circle around your subject, light when it's coming right down the axis of the lens, when that speed light is right in the hot shoe, or when you have the sun right behind your head, 
that's flat light. It's not creating any shadows to speak of. Both sides of your subject's face are equally lit. It's a shapeless, boring image. And we'll see some good examples of shapeless, boring images coming up really quick. And then it basically, as you think about moving your speed light in that circle all the way behind, so the blue and the magenta positions, that's rim light. And the orange and the green speed lights, that's all the way up to basically where the camera's at, just a little bit off, off axis. Those are good spots for key lights or fill lights. Shaping light. Shaping light largely has to do with shadows. How are we creating shadows in our images? And are we creating shadows that have hard edges? Or are we creating shadows that have soft images? Shaping light has to do, to a certain extent, with where you put your speed light to begin with. But more importantly are the modifiers. And I'm pointing across the room to a couple of soft boxes and some other modifiers that I have on the table that I use with my speed lights. <laughs> So the modifiers that you use with your speed lights will go a long way to shaping and creating those shadows. So the difference between these two images, the one on the left is ambient only, when basically the ambient was coming in a big barn door behind me. And you can see how flat Tom's face is. And then by using a speed light, I underexposed the ambient. And I'll take you through the shoot in a few minutes. I was able to create, and Tom's got such an amazingly textured face, I was able to create those shadows. Color of flash. Our speed lights are engineered so that the light they throw out has the color of noonday sunlight. Noonday sunlight, not sunrise and not sunset. So this is a quick example of how I used a gel to change the look of the speed light. On the left, you can see that it's got that kind of blue-white quality, and it doesn't really blend in to the quality of the setting sun that's coming from the camera right side of the frame. And on the right hand image, I use that amber CTO gel. And now that fill flash blends in very naturally with the setting sunlight. It's only one flash in this frame. And it was off to camera left. And the reason that that image on the right looks natural is because I used a gel to change the color. So think about how color relates to your images. Now, power. We're already down to number six. And for the first time, I talk about flash intensity or how much light's coming out of our flash. Most often, with somebody starting with speed lights, that's the number one thing they're worried about. How much light do we need? Relax about that and worry about the previous five things first. And then ultimately, think about power. Now, there's two modes that I jump back and forth between on my speed lights. One is ETTL mode. That's Canon's evaluative through the lens technology. The camera is working with the speed light to throw a pre-flash out, a 1 32nd power pulse of light. It's looking at where that light is coming back from. It's looking at how much light is coming back. And it's comparing those meter readings to an ambient meter reading that it did a split second before the pre-flash. And then it's going to compare them again just to check its numbers a split second after the pre-flash. And it's going to evaluate all that and make the calculations and say, OK, here's how much flash power the speed light should emit. Boom. Now, ETTL is great, as I mentioned earlier, for fill flash. If you're looking for an easy shot, put your camera in the hot shoe, put the sun behind your subject about 45 degrees up in the sky, put your speed light in ETTL, and let it figure out how much light the shadowy areas of your image need. All right? I use ETTL because it's an automatic flash mode anytime my subject to flash distance is changing. All right? Now notice I didn't say camera to flash or camera to subject distance, but subject to flash distance. So if I have off camera flash, and my speed light's on a stand, and my subject's not moving, and only the camera's moving in and out because I'm zooming with my feet, that's not a variable distance between the flash and the subject. But if I'm at an event, and I have an assistant who's got the speed light on a stick, a pole, and we're walking around the room with a small softbox on that light, a lollipop light, we call it, 
And sometimes that light is two feet from the person I'm photographing, and sometimes that light, because of the crowd in front of them, is eight feet away. ETTL is a great mode for that kind of shooting. Because with every shot, potentially, the distance between the flash and the people I'm photographing changes. Or if you're photographing your granddaughter, and she's in a swing set, and sometimes she's swinging back, and sometimes she's swinging up front. There again, even if that speed light is now parked on top of your camera, if the subject to flash distance is dynamic, ETTL is the speed light mode you want to be using. Now the one maddening thing about ETTL, as good as it is, is that it doesn't read our thoughts. It doesn't see our vision as a photographer. And that's where flash exposure compensation comes in. FEC, flash exposure compensation. That's a speed light function. You can dial it in through your camera or you can dial it in through your speed light directly. That's a speed light function where you say, hey, Mr. Camera Calculator, whatever power setting you come up with, add or subtract the amount I specify. So flash exposure compensation is the way for you to fine tune ETTL. All right? Now manual mode. Manual mode is where you, the photographer, literally dial the power for the flash into the flash. And if you're using multiple lights and they're assigned to different groups, then you're going to dial the power in for each of those groups. All right? Manual flash is the flash mode I use when the subject to flash distance is fixed. A year ago, I had a VIP shoot, and I had the VIP was a lady a race car driver, and there were 60 people who were coming through to have their portrait made at a, at a fundraising event for a charity. And she said, I'll give you 12 minutes. I thought I had 15. Shows up, she said, I'll give you 12. And now do the math. 60 shots, two, 60 people, two per person. How fast am I having to fire? It's like every 10 seconds to get this shoot done. In that instance, we taped off the floor. It's like, that's where you stand. The guest is going to stand next to you, of course. So if you stay there, fine. The lights are on stands. It went off without a hitch. I didn't have to worry about the flash power changing because the camera was seeing different things in the meter pattern from frame to frame to frame. So in that instance, manual is absolutely the mode to use. The other reason to work in manual is that when you change the power on your speed light, and let's say you make a change from a quarter power to a one-eighth power, and you don't see a big deal in your frame, you go, OK, then maybe one stop change is not that big. Or maybe you'll see a huge change. ETTL never tells us anything about the power that the speed light's fired at. It's hard to learn flash photography in ETTL mode. I'm a big believer in telling people, go out and make mistakes, because you'll learn way more from your mistakes than you will from your successes. Don't tell my kids I said that, please. <laughs> but we all know that to be true, as painful as it is. All right? So power. I want you to think about power, not necessarily in saying, oh, 1 16th is the right power to use, but more importantly, what's the right mode to be using your speed light in, in terms of whether the camera and the speed light are calculating the flash power, or whether you, the photographer, are calculating the flash power. And then finally, sync. There are three sync modes on our cameras and on our speed lights. First curtain sync. Second curtain sync and high speed sync. Now, first curtain sync is just normal flash sync. And if you're just making snapshots, it's a fine way to shoot. All right? But when the light gets dim, if you go into a restaurant, you're photographing a reception at a wedding, you're photographing a birthday party that's only lit by the 400 candles on the birthday cake, all right? Then you probably want to switch your speed light over to second curtain sync. Second curtain sync changes the timing of when the flash fires. And with longer shutter speeds, and I mean like a 15th of a second, or an eighth of a second, or a quarter of a second, at those longer shutter speeds, it will delay the firing of the flash until the very end of the exposure. This is the way that you get those shots where you see the person running down the sidewalk with the ghost coming out of the back of them because they're running so fast. The shots where you see like the person is dying with the ghost going forward, that's taken in first curtain sync. And that's only the difference between the timing of the flash firing 
and you have to be using a longer shutter speed. High speed sync, we're going to go into it. It is such an important part of my photographic workflow. You cannot do high speed sync with large studio strobes. It's a speed light only function and it's brilliant. All right. So if you live in a sun drenched environment or you shoot in a sun drenched environment, high speed sync is a flash mode you absolutely have to use. And the great thing is Canon put a button right there on our speed lights. It takes a half a second, it takes a finger push to jump between first curtain, second curtain, and high speed sync. You can just rotate through them. All right? Now, stick with me. If you're not a math person, don't let your head explode, all right? But I'm going to throw up some numbers on the screen in the very next frame. If you're going to be really serious about the craft of speed lighting, at some point, you have to force yourself to learn all these numbers. And don't write these down. <laughs> all right? Don't, don't write these down. But here's what I want you to know. And this, again, if you're just starting out, don't just go la, 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 la. <laughs> but if you're really serious about your craft as a photographer and crafting light, sometime you're going to want to know the mechanics between shutter, ISO, aperture, and flash power. And if you don't have a reference point to understand those four settings, then you're going to be making wild guesses. All this is a chart of is it shows you in whole stop increments. Now, a whole stop, I do want to explain this to you. So if you are a novice, take the hands away, stop the la la la, and listen to this. A stop is any time that we double or we have a camera setting. So what this chart shows me is that if I go from an eighth of a second to a fifteenth of a second, I've changed my shutter speed by one stop. Photographers use kind of fuzzy math because these shutters were invented pre-digital. So that's why it doesn't go eight, sixteenth, thirty seconds, sixty-fourth. Those are digital numbers, which happen to be how speed light power setting on the right hand side works. F stops. When I say stop, this is a lazy man's way of borrowing a term from the old lenses. When I started out, my lens actually had ring, a ring, aperture ring on it with numbers. And boy, we knew those numbers. So 2, 2, 8, 4, 5, 6, 8, 11, 16, 32, 45, 64, 90, 128. I'm an old view camera guy. And one time I had a lens that went down to f90. We thought that was really cool. It was like a, an ancient lens. And ISO is really easy to understand. So I throw this up here not to scare you, but to encourage you. Because once you understand the relationship between the shutter and ambient light, between aperture and flash power, you can make really informed decisions. And you might say, for instance, I'm going to dim the ambient by two stops, but in order to keep the flash the same, I either need to increase the flash power by two stops, or I need to open up the aperture by two stops. Now the problem is our digital cameras are really, really smart, and they have all these numbers in the bottom of the viewfinder. So I don't expect you to memorize things like 5.6, 6.1, 7.38. Just know that 5.6 and 8 are the important numbers, and the numbers in between 5.6 and 8 don't matter don't matter. That's the real point of memorizing these whole stops. Because I once had a student, I said, change it by two stops. And she said, I did. I went from 5.6 to 7.3. I was like, that's two thirds of one stop. She thought I was crazy. But I said, no, no, no. So that's where this comes from. If you need this chart, um, I'll be happy to send it to you. It's, or it's in any, pretty much any photo book in the world. So again, let's talk about how to create big light with small flash. Or if I want to use, I feel like Rocky and Bullwinkle, you know, it's Fractured Fairy Tales and there's little subtitles down below. Or we're going to talk about the beauty of off-camera, not the beauty of off-camera flash, but the beauty of off-camera shadows. So I'm going to take you through three shots. The shot on the left, all right, is on-camera flash. Shot on the right was done by moving the speed light on a short cord about three feet to the side of the camera. Notice that you can see shape of Mallory's cheeks. 
You can see the texture of her blouse, all right? Her hair has more depth and more highlight. That's only because the speed light shift is now creating shadows, all right? Same thing, but to a greater extent. On the left side, on the camera, flash. On the right side, I moved the speed light about 45 degrees to Jamie, all right? So it was about six or seven feet to the side of the camera. And yes, I will, if you're peeking ahead, think, well, what about that color? Because that color looks different. Yes, I did throw a half CTO gel, a slightly amber gel on the speed light because I wanted to create the look of like window light of western sun coming into this tack room. Okay, so the, that's why you see the color shift. But the more important thing to talk about, and look at this shirt. I mean, if, is there any place you can see it more easily than in the texture of his white shirt? Okay, when that speed light is in the hot shoe, it's killing all the shadows. Speed light in the hot shoe, great for fill flash. This is not fill flash. That speed light is in the key light position. It's the main light on the subject. And here is a more extreme example. On camera flash, and then we move the speed light to 90 degrees. If you're not a, a Boy Scout compass type person, then just think, oh, it was at 9 o'clock, and the camera's at 6 o'clock on the face of your watch. And you can create those dark, mysterious shadows. All three shots, the only difference really is where that speed light moved to off camera. So in terms of shadow quality and light quality, we need to think about whether the light we're creating is hard light or soft light. So here's an example, not a glorious photo, but it gets the idea across. Hard light is the light you get, and we all know this to be true, when it's a cloud, cloudless day and the sun is high overhead. You get those hard edges as you're walking down the sidewalk. Soft light is the light we get on days like today where there's high overcast clouds. And depending upon the intensity of the clouds, the size of the cloud bank, sometimes there are defined shadows, but they have a soft transition from dark to none. Other times the shadows just disappear entirely. So we create hard light by having a small light source, smaller than the subject. We create soft light by having a large light source, larger than the subject. And the size of the light source, small or large, is relative to the size of the subject. If I'm photographing a little matchbox car, then I can use a, a speed light right over the top of it with no modifier and create soft light because the speed light's bigger than the matchbox car. But if I point that speed light at a real car, obviously the car is much, much larger than the speed light. The reality is most of the time you point your speed light at anything, whatever you're photographing is going to be larger than your speed light. So inherently, our speed lights create hard light. Hard light comes about because we're sending the light at the subject from a narrow set of angles. So of all the rays of light that my speed light is throwing out, only the rays from a very narrow set are hitting the subject when I'm firing direct. Don't you love my handsome red-haired model there? <laughs> I do. It's much thinner than I am in real life. Soft light. So if I take a translucent diffuser panel and throw it between the speed light and the subject, now the lights hitting those light, the rays of light that are going to the outside hit the diffuser panel, and some of those light rays are going to turn direction, bounce literally off the fibers in the diffusion panel, and change direction, and now effectively the diffuser panel becomes the light source. The diffuser panel is bigger than my subject, therefore I'm creating softer light. So clouds will create soft light from direct sunlight, but more often than not with our own speed lights, if we want soft light, we have to make the speed light appear bigger than it really is. We'll talk more about the gear that we use in just a moment. So we're going to go back to those shoes. And the difference between the hard light and the soft light in this shoot 
was to create the soft light, I literally put in this six foot by six foot last light skylight panel, big diffusion panel. You could do something very similar with a really thin, cheap white bed sheet. All right? All that happened to make the shadows go from hard to soft is we took the direct light from the sun, and the sun, even though it's huge, Earth is so far from it, it's a relatively small part of our sky. That light comes at a very narrow set of angles. And all I did to soften that shadow was to put that big diffusion panel behind Mallory. All right, continuing on with that thought of hard light and soft light. This is a bit of a mind number. It took me a while to understand this. If you don't understand it, just accept it and then understand it later. Acceptance is more important than understanding sometimes. The closer the light source is to your subject, the more dramatic the shadows are going to be, the greater the fall off. So let's take a look at an example. All right? So again, the closer the light source is to your subject, the more fall off you're going to have. So if you want beautiful shadows, you actually have to push the soft box or the umbrella or the diffusion panel in really close, as close as you can get it. Because the farther out you pull that modifier, the smaller it gets and the more even the lighting becomes. So here's two quick headshots. The one on the left was done with a white umbrella that was four feet away. And then I took that umbrella and we literally got out the tape measure to make sure that I was being precise. We moved the umbrella back 16 feet. Okay. Now look at the difference on, between the right and the left. A couple, couple things. On the left hand side you'll see shadow on the camera right side of Sandra's chin and you'll see how the background is dark or at least darker. On the right hand side notice how the background is brighter and notice how that chin shadow is on. I'm not saying that one of these images is necessarily better than the other. It depends upon your vision and your needs and your wants. But the important thing here to understand is that by moving the light farther out, it creates a more even field of light and shadow. So here's another shot. Beautiful, soft light falling off to black mystery. OK? This was a workshop demo shoot. I used a softbox very similar. That's the Westcott Apollo Orb. I used a square version of it, which has the lovely name of being the Apollo 28. Here's the, here's the shot. This is literally what the room looked like during the shoot. It had that much ambient light in it. OK? So I sucked out the ambient light with my shutter speed. 200th of a second. And I lit the model with a soft box. It became the key light. And because it was in close, literally just out of frame, see how it's like a foot away from her head. OK? If I had pulled that soft box back four feet, or if I hadn't thought about it and just dropped it on the ground and said, OK, this is good, and you stand over there and take the shot, then what you're going to find is that that shadowy area is much, much less dramatic. I say this lovingly because those of you who've tried to understand the inverse square law may have found that your head ached like mine did. And I still don't really want to go there and say, oh, yes, I love the inverse square law. I mean, who knows what the heck that really means? Right, but like I said, what does it mean? Here's the simple part. As light travels farther, it spreads out. So here's my handsome three lads, Tom, Vin, and Tony. Tom is on the left, Vin's in the middle, Tony's on the right. When I have my direct flash four feet away, frame on the left, you'll notice that Tom is well lit and Tony is in dark shadow. By moving the speed light out, again, 16 feet, same tape measure, you'll now see that Tom, Vin, and Tony are all equally well lit. So the way that I worry about the inverse square law is when I want to create shadows and mood in my images, my light's in as close as it can be. 
But if I need that soft light, then I'm going to have to use a modifier that takes that close light and makes it seem really big. Otherwise, the closer it is, the harsher those shadows are going to be, hard edged. But that's what I mean by harsh. If I need a broad field of even light, you're lighting groups, and for whatever reason, you've got one speed light that works, and the other one you brought for the other side of the set is busted, left behind, batteries doesn't work, it's just giving you a hard day, and you've only got one light, the thing to know is then you need to push your light out as far as you can to light that group. The inverse square law tells us why. I tend not to worry about that anymore. How do we make the flash bigger? All right, I'm going to talk specifically about modifiers. In terms of modifiers that make our speed lights appear bigger, there's three broad categories. Diffusion panel, which is what you see on the left, that's a three foot by six foot Lastolite skylight. There's a whole universe of umbrellas in different colors and shapes and sizes. I'll talk about one that I specifically carry with my speed lights. And then on the right hand side is a softbox. All right, so if you're not familiar with light modifiers, those are three basic modifiers that will all serve similar purposes, namely making your speed light appear larger. So now, if you're, gonna, if you're a note taker, and if you want to run out ahead of everybody else before they sell out, <laughs> these are the things that I use. We'll hold your seat if you want to run downstairs, but I'm going to keep talking. All right, so I have on the table there the Lastolite Easy Box Speed Light. Lastolite is a British company. They make very durable, pro-grade gear. They happen to make, in my opinion, the best soft box that's sized to strap onto a speed light. So when I'm traveling as light as possible, when I was in Dubai and they said, hey, you want to go and photograph this falconer? It's like, you know, on the edge of the Arabian Desert. I'm thinking, I don't want to haul a lot of gear out there. This is a soft box I took, OK? It's 8 inches by 8 inches. You can see it right over there. It folds up flat. It's got a metal frame, nylon, double diffusion. It makes beautiful light. I've tried others, and they don't work as well for me, largely because when I travel, I'm really hard on my gear. And that's one of the criteria I have for my gear. I'm not going to pamper my gear. It has to deal with me. I don't want to have to deal with it. So for instance, there are other small soft boxes that are made of cardboard encased with plastic that fold up very ingeniously. I'm not as big a fan of those, because in my kit, those come out looking more like a folded envelope than like a soft box. And hey, by the way, if you don't want to write all this stuff down, the, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, it says just head to the gear guide on speedlighting.com. I've got all of these things described, and I actually, no surprise, have links right back here to B&H. So here's an example of the beautiful light that the Lastolite Easy Box Speed Light can create. It's an 8 inch by 8 inch soft box, but it creates beautiful light. You can see it, it's right there. It's two feet from her face. Okay? Beautiful, beautiful light. Lastolite makes a couple of larger models that I happen to have. They also create beautiful light, but the thing that stuns me is how small this is and yet how beautiful and portable it is. So I mentioned the Westcott Apollo. This is my old friend, the medium or the 28 inch. Westcott Apollos, I can't recommend highly enough. And I don't have a relationship with Westcott. I don't have a relationship with Last Light. I'm just telling you stuff that I've tried that works for me. And here's what I love about the Apollo. Number one, relative to the cost of other soft boxes, these guys are really affordable. Mm, like 110, 120 bucks, somewhere in there sometimes a little bit less. Um, they open up like an umbrella, so they're really fast to set up. The other thing that I love about them is they have a silver foil lining. And so you put the speed light on the inside of the soft box, fire it to the back, the light hits the silver fabric, jumps all around, and comes out the front diffusion panel. Soft boxes like the Lastolite Easy Box, where the speed light mounts from the back and fires the light forward, they have to have an inner diffusion panel. Otherwise, you get a very hot center in that soft box. And if that's the look you're going after, great. But if what you want is as big a field of soft, even light as you can get, 
the Apollos have the advantage, in my opinion, of actually outputting more of the light you throw in there because it doesn't have to go through two layers of diffusion. Now, full disclosure, of course, if we're going to mount that speed light on the inside of the softbox, we have to have a way to control it because if you have to change the power, you've either got to open the speed light or use a long ETTL cord. There's also radio options. There are radio poppers and there's the Pocket Wizard Control TL system, all right? Both of those systems have advantages and disadvantages. Number one disadvantage, if you don't have the gear already, you'll find it's very expensive. It's about $200, $225 per unit, and you have to have at least a transmitter and a receiver. So it's $400 plus just to get into that wireless technology. If you're in an environment where a long cord going from your camera over there doesn't work, like a, an event, then obviously that wireless technology and the price of it makes sense, all right? So here's the light that the Apollo creates. And the one thing I want to point out, if you go to a photographer's party, you can sound very erudite by saying, well, yes, of course, the Westcott Apollo 28 is the one I use when I want to create a window light catch light. Very <laughs> subtle, but it is square. And if you're saying, I want to be like Rembrandt with my photography, well, windows are square, so ultimately you want square catch lights. Because if you go to the orb, which is now my new favorite, <laughs> you'll see in a minute, you actually get a catch light that looks like the sunlight because the sun is round. And when we have round catch lights, all right, it suggests that you're actually outdoors. So this is my son, Vin, goofing off with me in the studio. And we were marveling at how big the orb was. All right, compared to the 28 inch. It really seems much bigger because of its shape. But I love either one of these. If I was going to say pick one or the other, I'd say whichever one is in stock the day you want to buy it. Okay? Um, the 28 inch square one does have one advantage, and that is that the front panel is recessed about five inches, where on the orb it's recessed a couple of inches. And that deep recess gives me the ability to create an edge to the light. It's called feathering. And so I can angle that softbox. Nothing in the rule book that says the softbox has to point at your subject. I can angle that softbox so that most of the light is just flying in front of my subject. And by doing so, I'm, if I, my subject is very close to the background and I want the background to be dim so you focus on the subject, I can feather that softbox, throw most of the light away, and keep the light off the background. That deeper recessed edge in the square is a decided advantage in that regard. So there's an example of the catch lights. It always helps to be handsome or to have a tall sun when you need to do demos like this. So sunlight catch lights is another advantage of the orb. So what do I do in terms of gear talk? How do I connect the softbox to a light stand? So you can see in the image here, Speed light is connected into the hot shoe end of a long cord. I use the Manfrotto 026. I'm not really big on a lot of model numbers, but this is one that's etched in my head, the Manfrotto 026 swivel adapter. It's all metal. It's about 25 bucks, which means it's going to cost you 10 bucks more than the all plastic version. The all plastic version someday is going to come out of your gear bag in two pieces. I don't know what day that is. And you won't either, but it will be a disappointment. So just start with the heavy duty model. The 10 bucks is well worth it. <coughs> and as you can see right in the center of the image, just like an umbrella would mount through that hole in the swivel adapter, the Apollo mounts through that hole. Now one of the things I also like about the Apollo design is that I can use two or three or four speed lights or more if I had multiple brackets and multiple speed lights. All right? So why would I want to use multiple speed lights? Well, let me tell you this. It doesn't really change the quality or the shape of the light coming out of the softbox. But three speed lights firing at one-third power each recycle much more quickly than one speed light working at full power. So if you're working a shoot, if you're shooting high school seniors, for instance, and you're a real hip, you know, not necessarily like yours truly, um, and you've got a fast pace shoot going and you need your speed lights to fire like this and you've got speed lights and not studio packs that you plug into the wall because you do a lot of senior portraits on location 
then three speed lights working together will be a great solution for you because of that recycle time. Now, to fit multiple speed lights inside of an Apollo, you've got to use a bracket. In this case, this is the triple threat, which is made by a company called IDC. And I know it's on the B&H site. Um, and that triple threat mounts literally right around the shaft of the Apollo's um, handle. And you mount the speed lights in north, south, and east, or however way you want to think about it. OK? Now, this system is also taking advantage of Canon's built-in wireless. So the speed light that's connected to the cord's hot shoe becomes the master, and the other two are slaves. And I can even use that master speed light inside the softbox to control slaves outside the softbox. So it's an incredibly versatile system. So there's the cord I was talking about. Okay, this one happens to be 33 feet. And it goes a long way. You think, well, 33 feet's a really long distance. Well, the reality is the working range is about 20 feet. Five foot from the camera down to the floor, runs across the floor, five foot from the floor up to the stand, all right? Word of warning based on experience, long coiled cords do not work. There are coiled cords that say it's 20 or 30 feet, and when you take it out of the box, it's like four feet, okay? So you're not thinking on a shoot, and you go to get that extra distance, and all of a sudden, it doesn't just pull your stand over, it like catapults it. Because you stretch out the coils, and the coils say, oh no you don't, and they come back together, and wham, your speed light hits the deck. Okay, so avoid coiled cords at all costs, unless you're using the short cord just for something at arm's length. That's not a big deal. But for anything that's 10 plus feet, coiled cords are a nightmare for me. Okay, umbrellas. An umbrella, if you're just starting out and 100 bucks seems like a lot to spend on a modifier, then look for a convertible umbrella. It'll cost you 20 bucks, 30 bucks. Now the thing about a convertible umbrella that makes it special is that what it really is is a shoot-through umbrella. It's an umbrella made of white satin that has a black cover that you remove. So you can use it theoretically with a cover in place. It becomes a reflective umbrella. And with the cover removed, it's a shoot-through. Well, the great thing about that cover is if you don't take it off all the way, you can solve the biggest problem I have with umbrellas, and that is that they want to throw light in a really wide arc, just like the shape of the umbrella. Go figure. Softbox has got a flat front. It sends light that way for the most part. Umbrella's got a curved front. It sends light that way for the most part. So here's an example. On the left, I have a convertible umbrella, and it's completely naked. It's unflagged. And you can then compare that shot to the image on the right and say, well, what's the difference? The only difference was that the shot on the right, we covered up one half of the umbrella with its built-in cover. I flagged it. So now I'm using the large, soft surface of that shoot-through umbrella to create really beautiful soft light on Sandra. But the convertible cover is being is the flag, and we're keeping the light off the background. So the only thing that changed between those two images is using that convertible cover. So if you're going to go the route of umbrellas, which is a great way when you're starting, they're inexpensive, okay? Look for a convertible. The one that I carry with my speed lights, made by Westcott, it's a double fold. It folds down into a package that's about 12 or 14 inches long. Okay, it's just like a double fold umbrella that appears on every street corner here in Manhattan when it rains. All right, now I want to comment very quickly about huge umbrellas. I love big umbrellas. By big, I mean like 60 inches or 72 inches or 84 inches. And just to come clean, I own exactly five speed lights, and I hold up you know six fingers. Go figure. I own. Five speed lights. But any time I can, I will beg, borrow, and steal your speed light. Why? Because if one is good, then 10 is going to be cooler. All right? So this is a snapshot done last summer up in Maine. And the opening shot for 
this talk was created with seven speed lights firing into a big umbrella. Okay? One of those speed lights was a master, the other six were slaves. Why did I use seven? Well, I used seven instead of 11 because I couldn't find the four square bracket in the <laughs> bottom of my bag. If I'd had the four square, I would have used them all if I could have. We were fortunate enough, Canon sponsors that workshop, and they sent us a trunk, literally 26 speed lights for us to play with that week. So if you got them, use them. Another tip, it's not really a matter of how many speed lights you own. It's a function of who your friends are that shoot <laughs> Canon. Okay? And I say that tongue in cheek, but it's actually kind of serious. If you've got a couple and you've got a couple and you've got one, then you need to meet that guy over there because he's got six. But if you guys all get together, if I did my math right, the four of you get together to shoot, you have 11 speed lights in the midst of you. All right? So big umbrellas become big light sources when you throw lots and lots of speed lights in them. Okay? The other thing, we're not going to go deep, deep into high-speed sync, but pay attention when I am talking about it because you can use high-speed sync to shoot at amazingly fast shutter speeds, but the cost of high-speed sync, of turning it on, is two and a half stops of power. So as soon as you jump into high-speed sync, it helps to have friends with lots of speed lights. And just as a reminder, a lot of these shoots that I'm talking about, a lot of this gear and a lot of these concepts, Okay, you can head over to my blog, speedlighting.com, and you'll, you can revisit. And I go through, actually, details about the whole shoot. Sometimes we want to make the flash smaller. If bigger light works because it creates soft light, then making a speed light smaller, you can think, well, gosh, that must be just the way we create hard light. You can create hard light all day and all night straight out of the flash. That's not necessarily why we want to make a speed light appear smaller. More often than not, it's because I want to use light in one area of the frame and not another. So the first place I'm going to start, if I can, is the zoom button. That's the fourth button over on the right-hand side, or the first one from the right edge, depending on which way you start. And you can hit the zoom button, and you can take your speed light and zoom it from 24 millimeters, a 28, 35, 50, 70, 80, and 110 millimeters. And up in that upper left-hand corner, 14 millimeters is what you get with that little garage door that you can pull out, the translucent one. I really don't ever use that thingy, all right? Because it's throwing light everywhere. Even inside of an Apollo softbox, I don't use that garage door. I'll zoom my speed light to 24 millimeters, okay? So this is an example. Camera position is locked down on a tripod. My ever-enduring son, Tony, is standing there. And boom, I can create two radically different images just by the zoom button on my speed light. All right? Now, if that pattern that I cast on Tony's face was still too big, then I can use a snoot. Now, my favorite modifier in this regard is the Rogue Flash Bender. And I don't have a relationship with the guys who make these either. They send me gear when, they when it comes out. I talk about what I like. And I don't talk about the things of theirs that I don't like. And that's just kind of the way it is. I really, really like the Rogue Flash Bender. So when you're running downstairs to go get that Last Light Easy Box Speed Light, tell the guys you also want the large, and that's key in my world, the large Rogue Flash Bender. And this is exactly what I'm talking about right here. And basically, it straps on. It's got a built-in strap. And it's going to strap onto the head of my speed light. And it, on the back, it has three aluminum wands. Now, that's what makes this device really cool. Because if I'm shooting an aircraft hangar and there's nowhere to bounce light off of, all right, I can turn this thing and bend it slightly. And what's going to happen is my flash, if I turn the head up, is going to hit this and fly forward. But it's going to look bigger than if I was shooting it straight at my subject, all right? So that actually is a bounce reflector. We're making the light bigger, making those shadow edges a little bit softer. The other thing that we can do with this is that we can roll it as a snoot. And basically, a snoot is a tube that you put on the end of your speed light. 
Okay? So you can roll it like that. And the reason that I like this size more than the smaller version, which is basically half the length, is because longer snoots have a tighter pattern. Now, here's my super secret about using the Rogue Flash Bender as a snoot. I like to roll it inside out. Because when you have a snoot that's white on the inside, the light bangs off the walls. And by the time it hits the end, it's still bouncing. And so let's take a look at that. Here's direct flash. And here's a five inch snoot. Not a lot of difference. In fact, I could probably get the coverage of the five inch snoot by zooming the speed light to 105 millimeters. So there's the eight inch snoot rolled inside out. And the reason that I roll this inside out is because when it's white to the inside, that light hits the end and continues to flare out. If you want the tightest pattern possible, you roll it inside out. The third reason, I don't really talk about this in the presentation, so I want to show it to you. The third thing, and I actually use the Rogue Flash Bender more for this than any other purpose, is as a flag. If I want to light this gentleman, but I don't want light to fly behind him and hit the wall that he's standing in front of because I want to light my subject and typically not what they're standing in front of, I can strap this right on the, speed of my, the side of my speed light, black side towards the flash head, and aim this right here behind his shoulder. Now, no matter where I've zoomed that speed light, it's going to light this gentleman, but it's not going to light what's behind him. Flagging your speed light is so, so important. Light your subject and not the space behind them. Grids are another important modifier for me. Grids give me the ability to take a shot like this one on the right and turn it into a much more evocative image like the one on the left. <laughs> OK? So let's take a look. And this was indoors. It is studio in Seattle. And that's the modifier that's strapped on top of the speed light. OK? So single speed light, it's hard light. It's coming straight at her. But it doesn't look, you can tell it's hard light from the shadow on the wall. But in terms of the light on her face, because her nose is pointed in the direction of the light, it doesn't necessarily look like hard light. When you throw a big old jaggy no shadow across a the cheek, then you go, oh, I don't like that light. But when the model's face, your subject's face, is pointed at the light source, then you're eliminating that no shadow. And even hard light can look beautiful. So again, I dim the light in the room with my shutter. Shutter speed is the gateway to ambient. And then I light the set, which was literally just corrugated fiber fiberglass panels nailed up to two by fours. So a couple reasons to change the light of your speed light. We can make the speed light look like another type of light source. Our speed light, again, throws out flash that's the color of noon sunlight. And as you likely know, the color of sunlight when it rises and the color of sunlight when it sets is radically different than the color of sunlight in the middle of the day. So. On the left is the image of Mallory without any fill flash. And if this was a snapshot, great. But if you're trying to kick it up to another level, then you need to understand that your camera does not record light the same way that we see it. And in terms of shadows, that's so, so important. So fill flash over on the left-hand side just coming out of the flash as it is. And then fill flash on the right side gelled with CTO, color temperature orange gel. It's an amber gel. All right? So that's why this light blends in so well with the color of the setting sun. Again, it's a one light shot. And there's the gel over the front of the speed light. I prefer to use Honol gels, H-O-N-L, Honol gels. And I carry them in a little recipe card box. This is my gel kit. And in the back, I have several of the Velcro speed straps that you connect around the speed light. And then in the pockets in the front, I have organized 
the gels by color and they have a little the hook side of the velcro on both sides of the gel and the reason that I like these guys is they're big and I can put it on and I can take it off in one second and I don't have to be precise because believe me if you're gelling a sunset shoot you're going to start with maybe a quarter CTO just a breath of amber and then as that sunlight gets down a little bit lower it's going to get warmer and you say well this flash is not blending I'm going to go to a half CTO and then I'm going to go to a whole CTO and sometimes those transitions depending upon where you are what's in the atmosphere and how far the sun is going down sometimes that transition is like 30 seconds from one gel to the other and if it takes you 30 seconds to align your gel and put it in a little holder and get everything set so that the entire head of the speed light is covered you're you're done so I like the Honol gels because they stick on they stick off they rip off I can literally carry that whole kit around in the back pocket and get to work really well all right the other reason to gel, I could, I could do a whole two hour seminar on reasons to gel, both in terms of color correction and in terms of dramatic effect. So here's my friend Mark Cranach who lives across the river in New Jersey. And Mark is a big aficionado of film noir, cinema noir. And so one time when I was in the area I said, Mark, let's go out and do a little cinema noir portrait shoot. Now one thing I will say, cinema noir, if you're a purist, is of course always black and white. Sill doesn't do black and white anymore. Can't make me do it. I won't do it. All right? I see in color, I live in color, and I spent far too much time in black and white dark rooms during school. So everything I shoot in color. So this is my interpretation of cinema noir with color light thrown into it. Okay? So this is a two light shot. I've got a red gel that's actually on the speed light on camera left and it's serving as the master and the amber gel the same gel I used for that sunset shot is on camera right and I've got a grid over the top of that amber gel that's why you see that little scallop of light now sometimes when we're on a shoot crazy things happen and in this case I wasn't paying attention to the recycling time and my speed lights were recycling at different speeds so on one shoot the master fired, but the slave, the amber gel, didn't. I was like, well, I'll take credit for anything I can get a good shot of. <laughs> OK, remember that. And in this case, I wasn't even paying attention to my framing. So there's the speed light in the corner, but what a cool shot with that puff of smoke you know, drifting up into the light. And I planned it exactly like this, of course. <laughs> Not. Not. This is like we're, we're banging them out literally on the main drag in Asbury Park. All right, so we change up the batteries, we switch the lights, and there's another gelled light coming. And instead of this time, the red one's not firing, but the amber one did. And another cool, evocative shot. So when it comes to using colored gels, you can create all kinds of personality in your images. And you can change a boring, you saw, just to jump back, our set, that's literally how bright our set was. And that's not because we were in sunlight, that's the sodium vapor street light right over the top of us. Okay? So how do I suck out ugly sodium vapor light? Shutter, shutter. Shutter. shutter speed, okay? You're getting it, you're getting it. <laughs> so I'm using my shutter speed to underexpose the ambient, to suck out the ambient light that I don't want, and I'm bringing light back to my subject, and to a certain extent in this shoot, bringing light into the environment with my speed lights. All right, so speaking of shutter, most photographers know that we can use a shutter to emphasize motion or to freeze action. Slow shutter speeds will emphasize motion. Short shutter speeds will freeze. Now you know already that we can, as speed lighters, use a fast shutter to dim the ambient or to brighten the ambient. So shutter speed really is a camera setting that as a flash photographer, you need to use creatively. All right? I'll take you through my four-step workflow. And when I outlined kind of the seven areas, number one was ambient. So the first step in my workflow is to say, I want to control the ambient exposure first before I turn on my flash. Here again is an example shot. The difference between these two images is only the shutter 
you can actually see in the image on the left that there is a slight shadow on the wall from the model. It becomes far more apparent, far more dramatic when I dimmed the ambient light with my shutter. Two stops of shutter speed did that, all right? And of course, I had my speed light zoomed tight so that it threw just that pool of light on top of her. So there's the whole shot at a 30th of a second. And there's the shot at 125th. Early on, I said, I choose to be a photographer and not a retoucher. This is an example of what I'm talking about. You could take the original image, you could take that image and create this image in Photoshop if you knew how to drive Photoshop. But man, it is so much faster to change the shutter speed two clicks. And there we go. Actually, it'd be six clicks because my camera's set in one third stops. But you get the point. Two stops is a radical move with the ambient light, and it sends your viewer's eye right where you want them to look at it. And it gives you the ability to control the weather and the ability to control the time of day. All right, so wrangle the ambient light first. You all know this already. Ambient light's the light that's already there. Sunlight, window light, candle light, lamp light, on and on and on. You have to settle on what you're going to do with the ambient light before you turn on your flash. Because if you get that exposure dialed in based upon how much depth of field you want with your aperture and how much of the ambient light based upon your shutter speed, then you can bring your flash to the subject and shape that light and color that light and decide upon the power that's necessary. Most photographers jump in the other way around. They immediately turn on the flash and they have no idea what's happening to the ambient light in their shot. So here's a simple four-step workflow. This is my friend Tom coming up that you're going to see. And you'll see that I did an ambient-only test shot. And then I adjusted the ambient light using my shutter speed. Now, if you happen to be shooting in aperture priority mode, AV mode, okay, which I do half the time, if you're shooting in AV mode, aperture priority mode, you can use your exposure compensation to dial the ambient exposure up or down. Mr. Nikonian, put your hands over your ears right now, please. Because this is, doesn't work for you in the same way that it works in Canon's world. But in Canon's world, exposure compensation and flash exposure compensation are completely independent of each other. So we can, Canonistas, we can use exposure compensation on a camera in aperture priority mode to dial the shutter speed up or down. Now, if you prefer and you're working your camera in manual mode, then you are the exposure compensation. You just change the shutter speeds directly. But in aperture priority, I often work that way, especially when I'm starting the shoot. Set my camera to aperture priority at whatever aperture I want to shoot at. 2.8, 8, or 22 is typically the three that I stick to. And the camera's going to come up with an image. And then I will adjust those camera settings so I get the ambient light the way that I like it. Then, step three, okay, I've done a lot of blabbing and I have yet to turn on my flash. Step three, I turn on my speed light. Now, if you're working in ETTL mode, great. It's going to come up and do its meter thing on the bob, throw out the light. You're either going to like it or you're not. If you're in manual mode on your speed light and you don't have a clue where to start and you don't have the experience, just remember 1 8th power. Why? Because 1 8th power is about halfway down the power scale. Then you can decide, do I need more power or less? If you start at full power, you're going to go down and down and down and down. If you're already halfway down, then 50% of the options are thrown out. Okay? That's a great, and basically I can shoot three flash exposure shots and come in with my power setting without ever taking a meter reading. All right? So one-eighth power, then you go to whichever end. If you need more, you go up to full. If you need less, you go down to 28th. And then pretty much from those two shots, I can gauge about where I need to be. So you do a test shot with your flash turned on. And then finally, you see how the first two were repeating that pattern? 
you establish a baseline shot, and then you adjust it. And in my world, I would deal with the ambient light first, and I deal with it before I've turned on my flash. And then I turn on my flash and I adjust it. So let me show you how this works. Here again is my friend Tom Harris, who lives in my hometown. I'm going to get another five cents from the Chamber of Commerce and say Paso Robles, California. And this is Tom's tack barn. He is dedicated to preserving not only the cowboy's way of life, but specifically the stagecoach and the wagoneer's way of life, the teamster's way of life. So he has an amazing collection of wagons and draft animals and all the hardware that connects the two of them. So I want to do a portrait in his tack room. So we step into this barn. I turn on my camera and aperture priority at the aperture that I want. And that's the image on the left that the camera's programmed to make. OK, not great. Don't really know where I'm supposed to look if I'm the viewer. It's like I'm just looking around going, OK, there's some horsey stuff on the wall. There's this old grizzled guy. There's no question in the image on the right where you, the viewer, are supposed to look. You get a sense I'm leaving you some clues about his environment, but I'm really sending your eye to Tom because he is really the brightest lit element in the frame. So my first shot, I'm putting these four steps into motion. First shot, ambient shot in aperture priority. Why does it look so bright if I'm in deep shade? The camera's job with the meter is to try to turn everything to a medium shade of gray. It doesn't have a weather station on top of it to say, oh yes, we're standing in deep shade, therefore I'm going to make an image that looks like deep shade. <laughs> it's overexposing the deep shade. It has no idea where you're standing. If I was in full sun, it would still be trying to create a similarly lit image. All right. So I'm dialing down. I'm in aperture priority, so I'm dialing down the camera one stop through exposure compensation. Now I know from experience I've got enough light on the tack so that you'll get a sense of his environment. And now I can think about lighting him. So I turn on my speed light. Bam! Totally gave him a spray tan. Overexposed. <laughs> All right? Why? Because the camera is trying to relight the whole scene with flash. And I've tricked it because I've moved the speed light off the top of my camera on a long cord. I've zoomed it to 105 millimeters, and I turned the speed light on its side. I am totally messing with the camera's engineering. So quick sidebar. Even when you're taking a landscape portrait that goes this way, it's perfectly OK to turn your speed light on its side so the light you're throwing goes this way. I want to light Tom. I don't want to light the background behind him. All right? And I have with actually a little bit of effort and precision, sent the light on Tom at such an angle that I'm creating that contrast on the left side of the frame. I'm lighting Tom, but I'm not lighting what's behind him. On the right side, clearly those shadows are being created on the tack because there is light spilling over on the right-hand side. Camera has no idea what my vision as a photographer really is. So I'm not freaking out. I'm just using flash exposure compensation, in this case, I dialed my flash exposure compensation down. There's no direct relationship. If you make a, a minus one stop move in exposure compensation, it doesn't mean that you make a plus or minus one stop move on your flash exposure compensation. It just so happened that both stop, both moves here were minus one stop. Okay? Could I have done all of this manually, both my camera in manual mode and my speed light in manual mode? Absolutely. In which case, then, I'm just changing the camera settings directly rather than using exposure compensation on the camera and flash exposure compensation on the speed light. So that's how you go from an OK but not really exciting image on the left to an image that, at least in my view, leaves no question in the viewer's mind as to where you're supposed to look. Now, what are some reasons to use flash in broad daylight? Most people think, oh, I only need to turn on my flash when it's dark. I'll say actually the opposite is probably more true. The brighter it is, the more you need flash. And the reason for that is that human vision has an amazing ability to see a much broader range of brights and darks than our cameras can record. Even the most state-of-the-art cameras cannot record the full range of human vision. 
So I head out to a local auto dealer at high noon in Paso Robles. Ooh, another five cents. And I point the camera at the front quarter panel of a car sitting in a lot. And that's the image that the camera's programmed to create. I'm going to expose for the highlights, but all the details in the shadow, the tread, the asphalt, everything on that left-hand side of the frame falls away to nothing. OK? The image on the right is more like what I saw at the scene. And how did I create that? I used two speed lights. So the sun is providing the main light, and I'm adding fill flash. Speed light on the left is a master. The one in my hand is the slave. And all I did, again, make interesting light. One simple recipe is to point two light sources at each other, or in this case, sort of at each other. But the reason you can see into the shadows on the right here, the reason you can see the tire tread is now the difference between the bright brights and the dark darks are much smaller. When the difference between the bright brights and the dark darks is too great, then either you're going to blow important details out to white, or you're going to clog up details in your shadow. So fill flash with sun. Create it. So you backlight your subject. You can do it with flash. You can do it with the sunlight. In this case, I'm going to do it with the sun. And then you add in flash on the camera side. So here, on the left, you can see, without flash, the sunlight behind the falconer is creating beautiful rim light. And it's just like adding salt to your chicken soup. It's really done to taste. It's done to how you see. It's a really small accent element. So in the image on the right, then I've got a bunch of speed lights coming in from the camera side of the frame to fill back in. All right? And this ultimately is the portrait that we were after. I came to this shoot, which is outside of Reno, Nevada, and I had this vision of doing this down the lens portrait with the falconer gazing at me the moment, the moment that her falcon landed back on her glove. So of course, that's what Syl has in his head. The reality is when we get there, she says, oh, by the way, my falcon's not going to fly today. I've got a hawk. All right, so this technically is a hawk. <laughs> and that's fine. It still looks like a, you know, predator, an alpha predator to me. And he was a young bird who wasn't free flying. So remember I said I'm a photographer, not a retoucher. Well, there are some times where you have to step beyond the bounds of what you say because of what you find. And in this case, there was, I don't have this shot in here, I don't think, but there was a four-foot tether from his ankle down to her other hand. And I traveled a long way to make this shot. It was important to me. I was like, all right, we will deal with it. I think that's fine. I think that's fine. Because ultimately, this image comes very, very close to my vision. All right? How do you make a young hawk look like it's landing in the glove? You go like this. <laughs> and the bird's trying to stay, keep his balance. And that's how we create it. So there, for everybody out in YouTube land, is the secret. All right. You can use flash during broad daylight to change the weather or change the time of day. The recipe for this, for me, is to underexpose the ambient and then add flash to my subject. So let's take a couple of looks. The cover of Speedlighter's handbook has my son, Vin, beating the heck out of a couple of Cinderella pumpkins, all right? The Smashing pumpkin shoot. And after we did that shoot, I said, hey, stand there. He happened to be wearing this hoodie from the Spy Museum. And I actually loved the fact, if you know my son, Vin, this shirt is a good representation of Vin on any given day of the week. <laughs> All right? I love you, Vin, really. <laughs> and I looked at this, and I said, this, is, as his dad, is an iconic portrait at this stage of his life. <coughs> and I was able to create that soft, beautiful wraparound light, because we had multiple speed lights arrayed out on a rail. So by underexposing the ambient, I went from the shot the camera wanted to make, which is on the left side of the screen, to a shot that I cherish and one that I'm really, really proud of. One, because of who my son really is, is a, is a young man now. But two, because of the beautiful light that I was able to create through the synergy of many speed lights working together. And I'm holding my hands out here because those speed lights were literally arrayed in 12-inch increments on a, a piece of oak that I bought at Home Depot when I drilled 
holes in it and threaded in cold shoes and parked all these speed lights on that rail. And this is what I call gang lighting. And gang lighting is when you go borrow all your friends' speed lights and you're able to create, even though this was direct flash, I was able to create really soft light because the light coming from the left side was throwing shadows over to the right and the lights coming from the right were throwing shadows to the left and they were all canceling each other out and what was left was really beautiful soft light. All right, so we're going to kind of jump through this because I want to show you a couple of other shoots. But again, if you live in a sun-drenched environment, you can use your shutter. So I'm literally going to take my surly son, Tony, who was not really happy this day, as you can see. Yet another camera demo dad, really? Are, are you serious? Do we have to do this right now? Um, I'm going to take this, and I'm going to make Tony and Amy's minivan disappear into complete midnight black inky sky. So using the shutter speed, nothing changes. It's f22 throughout. ISO remain the same. If you watch at the top of the screen, you're going to see I just dial down in whole stop increments. OK? 25th, 50th, 100th, 200th, 400th. Knowing everything in whole stop increments, as I said earlier, is a really important skill. So that's the image the camera wanted to make. And then I'm using the shutter speed to dial it down. Look how blue that sky becomes. All right, so one stop under on a sunny day or two stops under on a sunny day is a really nice touch in terms of saying, how do I hit that saturation slider in before I ever take the picture? Now we move into, all right, is this a full moon? If you need to shoot full moon in the middle of the afternoon, this is one way to do it. We're three stops under. We can dim the night sky, four stops under. Uh-oh, Tony and his surly attitude are going away. <laughs> and five stops under, six stops under. I don't know if this is going to show up on the monitors, particularly on YouTube. We can barely see dark gray, all right? And, and it's gone. So you can change the time of day using your shutter. Now, what do we do when we want to use a really fast shutter to freeze action during the middle of the day? Well, high-speed sync is an amazing phenomenon. But to order, in order to understand high-speed sync, we have to understand what normal sync is. Your shutter mechanism has two curtains in it. And depending on the shutter speed that you're firing at, the first curtain may fly completely across the sensor. And then a moment later, the second curtain comes across and closes. Or if you're shooting at a fast shutter speed, your first curtain is going to start moving. And then the second curtain is going to start moving right afterwards. So at an 8,000th of a second, literally the gap between your shutters or between your curtains is a little slit that moves across the sensor. Now, the camera wants the flash to fire when the whole sensor is going to see the flash. It has no idea what you're pointing the flash at. So the reason that our cameras have sync speeds, in the case of the 5D Mark II, or any full sensor camera, it's a 200th of a second. Virtually everything else is a 250th of a second. Unless you have a 1D camera, then you get an extra third of a stop, and you shoot it at 320th. So in this case, first curtain moves. It's a point where it's completely across, the flash fires, second curtain closes. The sync speed of your camera is essentially the fastest shutter speed you have when the first curtain completely clears the sensor before the second curtain begins to close. OK? So here's an example. And the reason you say, well, why is the skateboarder upside down? That's because that's the way the image actually appears in the back of our camera. So that image is thrown up on the sensor upside down. So that's the same thing. You can see we need to fire the flash when the first curtain has completely cleared the shutter or the sensor and before the second curtain has begun to move. High speed sync, Mr. Nikonian, auto FP sync. What this does is change the way the speed light fires. It turns the, the speed light into a machine gun. Before, it's kind of like a cannon. It would go and throw out the light. And in high speed sync, it goes and it fires the light. It turns it on and off 30,000 times a second. So for a very brief fraction of a second, your speed light becomes a continuous light source. And what this means is that at higher shutter speeds, when the first and the second curtain are traveling together across the sensor, the flash is firing before, during, and after the transit of the first and second curtain. 
Now the downside of high speed sync is the two and a half stop power hit. So a lot of people say, well, you know what? I'll just use neutral density filters instead of high speed sync. And the problem with the neutral density filters, which essentially is like sunglasses for your lens, is that it can be really hard to focus or really hard to follow critical action. For the cover of Speedlighter's Handbook, that shoot involved a bat flying in front of my face at full swing, and oftentimes that bat was just a handful of inches away from my lens. It was really important for me to understand where the tip of that bat was. If I'd been using neutral density, we couldn't have done that. I'd probably end up smashing, smashing the lens because I'd lean into Vin too much. So high speed sync is an amazing, an amazing function. Now I want to take you through a couple of shots and I want to show you how I build light into the set. So this is my friend Zach Arias. Anybody heard of Zach? If not, you should all write down his name and write down Z-A-R-I-A-S.com. Zach is a commercial photographer in Atlanta and he um, has a workshop program. It's on hiatus right now, but it's called One Light Workshop. If you ever had the opportunity to study with Zach, absolutely do that. Uh, I've learned a tremendous amount from Zach. And the most important thing I learned from him is don't buy a bunch of gear until you've mastered the gear that you have. And he'll go into greater detail. But I wanted to do this portrait of Zach. And since he's known for lighting with one light, simple setups, I was thinking, how do I create light on two sides of Zach simultaneously with one speed light? So I ran the speed light off the side. I used the Rogue flash bender, which you saw earlier to keep that flash from firing on the background. I angled the flash so that a ton of the light flew right in front of his nose, and I bounced it into a $22 gold umbrella, or rather a reflector, $22 gold reflector that was angled so that it filled that shadowy side of his face. Okay, So here's an example of how you can use one speed light to create really beautiful and subject appropriate light. So there's the shot the camera made without any fill flash on the right hand side of the screen. So sending that light across the front of Zach into the reflector is literally what saved or created that shot. Okay. So very quickly, here's a shot called Chicago Bob. We saw this image earlier. All right. Now I don't know if you remember, but I, below it, it said, if you learn to craft light, you can create persona. So this was taken in Virginia City, Nevada, which is a historic town, mining town. And they have docents, basically living historians, who take on the persona, both in terms of how they talk, how they dress, their whole attitude of people who've actually lived in Virginia City. So what was the weather like? What was the time of day when this shot was made? And if you read the details in Speedlighter's Handbook, don't cheat and shout it out. For those of you who don't know the details, what time of day was it? Sunset. Sunset? OK. What was the weather like? Sunny. Sunny. Thank you for falling into my abyss. You know the answer already. This was shot in the middle of the afternoon during a rainstorm. <laughs> All right. How do you make the look of golden sunlight setting? Well, it took speed lights outside, baggies over the top of the speed lights in the rainstorm. I ran the master speed light to a window on the cord, and it sent the instructions outdoors to the guys outside who were gelled with deep amber CTO gels. And because that light came in through the windows, if you want to create the look of window light, your flash needs to go outside. It's really, really difficult to create the look of window light when your speed light is on the same side of the glass that your subject is because all those little nuances and those little things that happen in the background are created by the light flying through the glass and flying through the lace curtains and all of that business. The color comes because of the, the acetate. And by the way, this is my ambient only shot. From time to time through a shoot, I'll turn off my speed lights or I'll unplug the cord from my hot shoe and shut all the speed lights off so that I can remind myself of what's happening to the ambient light. I do that at the beginning of a shoot. I build up from there. But from time to time, especially when you're blowing and going and you're making lots of changes, 
you think, all right, I got to go back to ground zero. So it was really important for me to know when I was doing the shot on the left that that's what the ambient light in the room looked like. Why was it important to me? Because the ambient light that day was very, very blue because it was coming through a ton of clouds. Okay, and I wanted this very warm light. So there's just a quick lighting diagram of the speed lights outside the window with the master at the glass firing the instructions out to them. Okay. So they weren't right up against the glass? They were no, they were like 10 feet away. Great question. The question was how far away from the window were those speed lights? And those speed lights were 10 or 15 feet outside the building. And they were up on top of a C stand. They were up um, higher than I could reach. We had to tip the stand over to, to mount them. All right, so here's a vineyard wedding. And one of my favorite shots okay, of this wedding I want to build it for you. This is the image the camera is programmed to make when you point it at a setting sun. It's going to kill everything and make cra a crappy image. It's overexposing the western sky. All right. So I dial down one and two thirds stops. I normally try to work in whole stop increments, but I also want to be truthful. When I looked at the metadata here, I didn't go one more click over to two full stops. It was at one and two thirds. So I dialed down the ambient light, which in this case is what captures the beautiful color up in the clouds. If you point your camera at a sunset, you will find out how bright that western sky really is long after the sun has gone below the horizon. All right. So again, I'm dimming the ambient, and then I'm bringing the light back to my subjects. So in this case, what we did is I put a Stofan dome diffuser. It's a little plastic box. And I literally stuffed the Stofan over the speed light with a piece of double amber gel. I wanted a lot of warmth in that light. And I had one of my sons hold that whole rig over the top. And I had a master speed light in my camera that was sending instructions to the slaves. So this essentially is while it's using two speed lights, the light you see in the shot is actually coming from only the slave speed light. Because in wireless flash photography, you've got the ability to disable the master. And what that means is not that the master is not doing its job sending the instructions to the slaves. What that means is that when the shutter is actually open, the master remains dark. It sent all the instructions to the slaves in the pre-flash series before the shutter curtains move. Then when the shutter is open, that master is dark. So that's a disabled master. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit hard to understand. It's not the words I would have used. How do you, how do you do that? You go back and you look at the class I did here in December, which was all on multi-light wireless. So that's how the, the question was, how do you do that? And um, it's not a short answer, but it's also not incredibly complex. Hey, everybody, I want to thank you for coming to B&H Photo this afternoon. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And I hope you'll all run downstairs and buy all those light modifiers that I talked about. <laughs> For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.